Uh, Mr. Zelikow, you have um, described the reaction to your report, and uh, Senator Graham serves with great distinction on the Armed Services Committee, which has done a report of its own. Uh, without objection, I'd ask that 119 to 128, those pages of the report, be admitted into the record, and selectively, uh, I can report from that uh, that there was a great deal of disagreement with the OLC analysis and serious concerns and objections over some of the legal conclusions reached by OLC, that the Navy General Counsel Alberto Mara called the OLC memo relied on by the working group in 2003 profoundly in error and a travesty of the applicable law, that uh, now Rear Admiral Dalton likewise said that to the extent that the working group report relied on the OLC memo, it did not include what I considered to be a fair and complete legal analysis uh, of the issues involved. There was a chart that was created based on the OLC opinion, uh, and the result of that chart, it had a sort of green means go column for techniques that uh, were authorized. Uh, Rear Admiral Dalton, again, that green column was absolutely wrong legally. It was embarrassing uh, to have it in there. Uh, most, if not all, working group members and judge advocates general disagreed with significant portions of the OLC opinion, but were forced to accept it. And um, at Mr. Haynes' direction, the report con continues, uh, Ms. Walker instructed the working group, instructed them to consider the OLC memorandum as authoritative and directed that it supplant the legal analysis being prepared by the working group action officers. You and your testimony, Mr. Zellico, said that when your alternative views, if you will, uh, were made known, you heard that the memo was not considered appropriate for further discussion, to use your phrase, and that copies of your memo should be collected and destroyed. What do those behaviors tell you about the environment for proper legal debate and discussion about this question at the highest levels of the administration? It told me that um, the lawyers involved in that opinion did not welcome peer review of their, of their conclusions and indeed uh, um, would shut down challenges from peers even inside the government. Lawyers love to debate. It's our nature to quarrel with each other and to exchange views. Um, is there any suggestion that you would draw that they were less than perfectly confident in their views when they weren't willing to subject them to peer review. That's ordinarily viewed as the test of confidence in one's judgments. Well, um, the arguments I was making were pretty uh, profound. Because if I was right, um, their whole interpretation of the CID standard was fundamentally unsound and raised really quite grave issues about their interpretation of constitutional law. Now, they have a couple of options there. One option is either they or the NSC legal advisor or the White House counsel, is to say, gee, let's take another look at this. Uh, the case law you cite has some merit. We'll take another look. Or they could say, Zellico, uh, boy, this shows how rusty you are in practicing law. Um, we need to set you straight and tell you why you've just fundamentally misunderstood this whole area of the law. Uh, they didn't do either of those things. Instead, what they preferred to do was see, um, we don't want to talk about it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask a question of Professor Luban, then I'm going to give uh, the distinguished ranking member uh, some time. Uh, and then I think the hearing is already a bit over time, and I have a, a plane to catch to an important engagement. So uh, I'll make a closing statement after that. Um, my question for you, uh, Professor uh, Luban, has to do with the Lee decision, a Texas decision. I note that Professor Atticutt didn't cite it in his opinion, despite the fact that he's from... Uh, Texas, and it was a Texas decision. Lee, I don't know if we have the diagram, but Lee describes waterboarding and describes it as torture over and over again. I mean, here's a picture of the actual pages of the Federal Reporter highlighting the U.S. Department of Justice prosecution about all the times in which the court refers to this technique as torture. And what's astonishing to me is that in 93 pages, where they dig out Medicare reimbursement law as relevant, they don't find a case on point, or they don't discuss a case on point, in which one of the highest courts in the land, the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, 
describes waterboarding and calls it repeatedly, I think it's 12 times in the opinion, torture. That's fine, thanks. Um, I've pressed the Department of Justice on this question because I think it's unimaginable. I've discussed this on the Senate floor. I've, I've, I've pursued it in hearings. Uh, the Attorney General, Attorney General Mukasey's response was that it wasn't relevant because it was brought under the Civil Rights Act. And a case brought under the Civil Rights Act doesn't relate to a case brought under the torture statute or under the, conventions, the Convention Against Torture. And at that time, I was out of time, and I didn't have the chance to follow up. Um, but I'd like your legal opinion on that, because it strikes me that the Civil Rights Act, under which Sheriff Lee was prosecuted, convicted, and jailed for the crime of waterboarding, um, has no substantive elements of its own. It's a vehicle for enforcing constitutional requirements and for punishing constitutional violations so that the Civil Rights Act leads directly, with no interference from the statutory point of view, directly to constitutional standards of torture. If you look at the Convention Against Torture and what OLC itself said about it, the definition of that treaty obligation is also founded, according to OLC itself, directly in the constitutional standards of the United States. And to the extent that the statute against torture applies, it is impossible for Congress by statute to overrule the Constitution. And so, as a matter of fundamental law, the statute criminalizing torture cannot create a definition of torture that narrows the constitutional definition. So it seems to me that wherever you go with this, all roads lead to Rome. Rome is the Constitution and what it says about torture, and that the distinction that is drawn is yet another false device thrown out there to confuse and uh, distract from the fundamental fact that they either missed the case on point or they found it, hated it, and didn't bother to put it in the menu, in, in the memo, and I guess we'll find out from the OPR which it was. But what are your comments on that? Yeah, um, Senator, I, I agree with your diagnosis of it. Now, the, um, the Lee case was decided in 1983. That was before the convention. Under President Reagan. This was charged that, by the Department correct. of Justice of President Reagan. That's correct. Um, it, it preceded the Convention Against Torture um, and the torture statutes. Um, so it's, it's not surprising that it didn't mention these because they didn't exist yet. Uh, the word torture was not defined eccentrically or in a way to change its meaning in the torture convention or the torture statutes. It's roughly severe mental or physical pain or suffering. I took the liberty of looking at dictionary definitions of torture from around uh, the dictionaries that would have been available to the court that was writing uh, um, the Lee opinion, and uh, that's more or less the same definition that you find in the Oxford English Dictionary uh, edition at that time. So the word hadn't mysteriously changed its meaning. The torture statute and uh, the torture convention were giving the words very, very common sense, everyday, non-technical meanings. And what's striking about the Lee case is that the court just used the word again and again and again as if it was obvious that this technique of leaning the guy back in the chair, putting the towel over his face, pouring the water on until uh, he thought he was suffocating and started jerking and twitching, uh, that they, they had no problem calling it torture. The word means exactly the same thing in the dictionary definitions of 1983 as the definition in the treaty and the statutes that followed. So there's absolutely no reason in the world that we should think that the fact that it was decided as a constitutional case rather than a torture statute case would have led to a different outcome. 